फोर थ्री वी आर लाइव नाउ गुड मॉर्निंग वेलकम टू दिस स्पेशल एडिशन ऑफ आईओ पीडियाट्रिक और थोपड़ी सब कमिटी वेबिनार टूडे इज द नाइनटीन ऑफ मार्च एंड our dear friend dr joy patankar uh, who is no longer with us would have turned 60 today and uh, we thought what better way to celebrate joy's memory than to have a webinar on a topic which was very close to his heart and we are happy that we have a host or a galaxy i would say of a star faculty with us today who is going to participate in this, in this webinar uh at the outset let me uh welcome the ioa uh, secretary general dr navin thakkar who is here with us and asking to say a few words before we start the webinar okay welcome to all the faculty uh, on behalf of indian orthopedic association myself dr navin thakkar and this is a unique program by the ioa pediatric orthopedic sub committee in the remembrance of the joy patankar a pediatric orthopedic surgeon of the ddh screening to the solutions so i welcome all the faculty and i'm thankful to all the faculty for contributing sharing for the ddh screening which is a great problem and this will make all the orthopedic surgeons all the members of indian orthopedic association to learn something so without disturbing much time for academic content please continue your work i have to join another uh, webinar of advanced nailing where i have to present sir so once you allow me i will leave uh, for the another uh, webinar because that has already started thank you thank you navin bhai uh, okay i can see ram is here ram is the president elect yes, yes. of the indian orthopedic association and uh, i would welcome ram on behalf of the ioa sub committee and uh, ram was a great friend of joy i i i hope uh, jo, uh, ram can say a few words uh, before we start the webinar morning everybody uh, respected past presidents of the indian orthopedic association including professor johari uh, dr navin thakkar my dear friend secretary general of the ioa and senior members from overseas and here i welcome you all remembering joy is something that has actually pulled me into this gathering today joy and i were classmates batchmates and we were extremely close we qualified as medical graduates together entered the orthopedic stream together and joy was one man whom we always remember for his zeal and zest for teaching for doing something different for challenging the challenging the status quo and to move ahead despite all adversities and we really do miss him as he would have turned 60 he is 6 months older than i am um we look forward that his legacy would be carried by many stalwarts here and that teaching would progress at that same level that joy initiated and wanted it so god bless you all keep it up and on behalf of the indian orthopedic association we appreciate what you are doing for a dear friend on a personal ground and for a great teacher as far as the larger picture is concerned thank you all god bless you thank you thank you ram for the kind words and uh, before we start i would just like to play a small video which uh, was made by joy's children and i would appreciate if you just pay attention to apoorva gopi koshonya विज्ञेय तेवर भाई यू आर नॉट संदीप यू आर नॉट शेयर्ड विद अस सॉरी सर जस्ट गिव मी अ मोमेंट यू आर नॉट शेयर्ड या आई विल स्टार्ट अगेन सॉरी नो यू हैव टू शेयर फर्स्ट सर शेयर है या कैन यू सी यस यस वी कैन सी इट या ओके अपूर्व गोपी कोशोन्यम विज्ञेय तव भारती भयतो वृद्धि आयाती शयम आयाती संचय ओ गॉड इज सरस्वती योर ट्रेजर इज यूनिक इन नेचर इट इंक्रीजेस व्हेन इट इज फ्रीली स्पेंड एंड गेट्स डिस्ट्रॉयड इफ यू और चालू करो वाला 
joy our mama lived by this passion he loved to learn and share his knowledge whether that was in lecture halls across the globe or during long car rides with his family he was always a sight for so rides and a balm for the soul we loved him looked up to him and learned so so much from him one and a half decades have gone by in the blink of an eye we miss him every minute of every day and imagine that he would have loved to witness all our all our achievements he may not be of this realm but we include him in every moment we know that he watches over us and he will always be the joy of our lives we know that his family his friends colleagues and students all miss him dearly but we all cherish his memory and let it live on as thomas campbell wrote but strew his ashes to the wind whose sword a voice has served mankind and is he dead whose glorious mind lifts thine on high to live in hearts we leave behind is not to die thank you and uh, i would also like to just uh, remind everybody that joy had was the first person who had a great foresight that he 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 told us that it's going to be the ultrasound which is going to be the future in looking into the hip joint and he was instrumental in getting professor graf to india these are a few pictures can you see the uh, slides yes sir yeah yeah so you can see there professor graf when he came in 2005 to india he conducted the graf course first time which was to see joy and that's taral and dr johari uh, with professor graf that was the first patch of so called the pass outs from the indian uh, in pune where we completed the graf course over two and a half days and um, it was a great memory and here's professor graf again teaching people at the second graf course in bharti vidyapeet in pune again and a few memories this is the first brochure i just pulled out some things which i had so with that i am going to now stop sharing this and hand over the mic to professor graf who is here with us today thank you sir for visiting india and teaching us how to do the hip ultrasound and we would like to hear from you a bit of your memories of joy as well as about hip screening before we start the first talk by dr sandeep hemadi who runs the craft course at cardiff in wales thank you okay good morning uh, ladies and gentlemen it's an early morning and uh, i thank you for the kind invitation to speak some words um uh, about uh, chory i met him the first time in dorchester we also with uh, uh john gek and i was really astonished that uh, he was so enthusiastic about hip sonography this was the first time that i met an indian uh, uh colleague and uh, the next step was that he was inviting me uh, to come to india for a course and india in this time was far away for me and it was so astonished but uh, joy organized the course in an excellent way and he was so enthusiastic about hip sonography and he organized a second course there this was uh, the first step that he tried to spread uh, hip sonography in india but then uh when i had made more acquaintance with him he i realized that he was also a member in the rotary club and he asked me uh, if it is possible for me to come to a polio camp in india too unfortunately because of my full field time table it was not possible but two of my friends and colleagues dr scheitz and kurt leher uh, uh, they came uh, to the polio uh, camp and they told me afterwards that uh, joy uh, 
did an, org, uh, an excellent organization there. And also my two friends learned a lot of polio too. The next, the next step uh, was that uh, it was also next course in India. Uh, and then it was a problem that uh, Joy suddenly uh, was not alive. We had been really shocked about, but I think uh, what he did is still going ahead. And Dipti organized uh, or had to organize the course also in Goa, and uh, it was really great. Joy was a um, personality, as it were, he was a pioneer for hypsonography, for baby hypsonography, and he did an excellent work there, but he was also a friend. And today, I only can say, Joy, I miss you. Thank you what you did for the babies in India and that hope in and I hope in the future it's going ahead. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you, sir. That was uh, great listening to your words. And we have indeed come a long way now. And uh, we have developed the Indian guidelines. The second talk of the day by our vice president of COSI, Dr. Alaric, will highlight how the Indian guidelines have evolved and we are heading towards screening of babies, uh, which will suit the Indian population using ultrasound as well as clinical methods. So before we move to Alaric's talk, I would hand over the mic and ask Dr. Sandeep Hemadi, who is the pediatric orthopedic surgeon and foot and ankle consultant at Cardiff Wales to, to educate us about the craft technique screening and conservative treatment of uh, the hip dysplasia by braces as well as by plasters. Over to you, Sandeep. Uh, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, thank you for inviting me. Um, and it's, it's a pleasure to, to contribute to this uh, webinar. Uh, Joy was inspirational as a teacher and certainly influenced my uh, choice of a career in orthopedics. Uh, he also was instrumental in me uh, getting in touch with Professor Graf and, and introducing me to the Graf system probably around 2003. Okay, so I've got a short uh, period in which I'm going to try and um, probably explain to the people who don't regularly use the Graf method that all forms of hip ultrasound are not exactly equal. And you will still find lots of American literature which will say that ultrasound of hips is, uh, is not reliable and you can, you can uh, still uh, misdiagnose it. So very briefly, I'll, I'll talk about the, uh, a couple of methods that exist and then uh, we'll, we'll talk about the system we use. So um, Sandeep, I can't see you, so I'm not sure. Uh, can you see me uh, to move uh, next or? Yeah, I can see you. You can just raise okay. your hand. I okay. So what do we want from these ultrasound methods? We want uh, a scan which has uh, got high specificity and uh, very high sensitivity. So there are three main methods uh, in, that have been used across the world. You, you have Professor Graf's uh, method, which he described in 1980, then Haki's method, in, uh, which started in 1984, and then Turgeon's method, which came in uh, 1989. Next, Sunday. Okay, so I, I won't uh, talk about the, the other individual methods, but there's something that I want to sort of um, emphasize. Um, yeah, in, so in next, so this was Haki's me method. It, it, it's got, so the point I wanted to make was that to have a, a reproducible ultrasound scan, you need to define a standard plane. If you don't, I mean, all hip surgeons will know that the hip is not equally deep. Uh, it, is, it has a deeper wall posteriorly and, and it's more shallow anteriorly. So really you want to describe a plane. So if you go back one, sorry, Sandeep. If you want to describe a plane which goes through that green line because 
if you didn't define that standard plane and you were scanning the same baby, say in two different hospitals an hour apart, and the first uh, surgeon scanned roughly in line where the red line was, you'd get a shallow hit. And if you scanned where the yellow line is, you would get a deep measurement to the depth of the hip. So if you wanted to standardize something so that no matter where you scan the baby in Cardiff or Bombay or in, in Austria, you should measure the same angle each time, then you have to take significant efforts to define that standard plane. And that standard plane, any plane in three dimensional, you need three points to define it. So a system that is reproducible has to have a standard plane. Now, if the other, the, the other ultrasound method that I uh, described to you, Haki's method, if you haven't got a described standard plane, then you cannot expect to get uh, standardization across scans, um, across time. So next. So Turgeon's method relies uh, a lot about femoral head coverage. Now, we know, and everyone who's operated or done an open duction of baby's hip will know that a femoral head is not round. Uh, in a baby, okay, it is, it can be hazelnut shaped, it may be slightly um, um, rugby ball shaped, but it's not round. So any system, um, so your next screen, please, next slide, please. So it's difficult to find the center of a non-spherical object. Um, and next. So if you're using a system which assumes that the femoral head is round, every time you, the ultrasound is like a tomogram. So if the baby's leg were to rotate, and instead of having a round femoral head, it was oval. Every time the head rotates, you will cut a different section of the head. So your femoral head coverage can change within a couple of seconds. So if you have the first, um, uh, a fir the first scan, and then the baby's head, rot uh, baby's leg rotates by 10 or 15 degrees while you're scanning, you'll get a different section. And because the ball is not round and is oval, you will keep getting different femoral head coverages. So it's femoral head coverage is not very much more than eyeballing the, uh, the shape of the femoral head. You can't make it any more scientific down to a percentage because it changes in a baby hip every time um, you rotate the leg. Next. So coming to the, to the graph system. Uh, now, this in, in, in all the literature it is the most reliable and reproducible method of using an ultrasound. Uh, so I'll, I'll quickly go through the, the essential preparation that you need to, to get a good reproducible scan. Uh, you know, when you scan the baby, you want a nice warm room. Uh, you want the baby prepared before you scan. The cradle that you see here, the, the blue uh, device there, it helps to keep the baby uh, in a lateral position and comfortable. It makes acquiring a reproducible scan a lot easier. Uh, in addition to that, you have the sono guide, which is the metallic device that you see that holds your probe so that the probe cannot tilt. Uh, and the reason you'd want that is to get that standardized plane without a tilt and to make the scan reproducible, both these devices help you. Um, and it gives you more reproducible pictures than when you do it freehand. Um, and you need to use a, a linear probe. You don't use a sector scan scanning probe. Uh, next. So these are, these are the techniques that uh, we use to make the scan reproducible. Uh, if you attend a basic course, we'll teach you exactly you know, how to place your fingers, where you put the transducer. Uh, next, you know, how you, you acquire the image uh, by moving the transducer forward and backward over the, uh, over the trochanter so that you see the bright spot at the lower limb of the oscillium. And that's the main thing that you need to get on the scan uh, before you correct the sectional plane of the scan. Next. Once you've acquired this image, uh, we will learn to go through something called a checklist one, which is the most essential of, of, the, of um, the, the two checklists to assess the quality of the scan. The, the checklist one gives you the anatomy uh, of the picture uh, and, and you don't proceed to the next checklist till all the, all the, uh, the structures that you need to see on that initial scan. Um, after you go through checklist one and you go through checklist two, which, which checks if you have your, your scan in the correct standardized plane, uh, and then you make your, your diagnosis based on these. The angles that you measure, the alpha and beta angles, are only then used to subdivide the sections. 
Now in the graft system, the hips are divided into type one, which is a normal hip where the alpha angle is greater than 60 degrees. And for those of you who are not familiar with using this system, the, the 60 degrees on the alpha angle correlates well in, in equivalence with the acetabular index that you do on a plane film, uh, which is 90 minus 60, which we count as 30. Uh, the graph system also allows you to account for the age of the baby. So uh, you have type 2A and B. Type 2A is a physiologically immature baby. Um, so to explain that to you, let's say you had uh, a baby that had an alpha angle of 56 degrees. But if the baby was two weeks old, that might still be normal for that baby. So that group you would call physiologically immature. But if you had a baby uh, whose alpha angle was 56 degrees, but the baby was 14 weeks old, then that would be a pathological or, or a truly dysplastic hip. So 2A and B uh, allows you to make adjustments for the age of the, of the baby. This is the only ultrasound system where, which also incorporates the age of the child to help you make the appropriate decision. Now 2C really is the highlight of this system. Uh, it's the 2C hip, which often, or 2C hip clinically could have no signs, even in the most experienced hands. And it's these 2C hips, if you don't diagnose and treat, you will go on to get uh, your late presenting DDH. Uh, and I'll talk briefly about that uh, as, as we go along. Um, and then you have the, the decentered hips. Uh, in, in the ultrasound technology, we, in clinical practice, we talk about uh, located hips and dislocated hips. Uh, in, on, when using the ultrasound system, you talk about centered hips and decentered hips. And you have to have a clear demarcation where a centered hip becomes decentered. In clinical practice, we talk about a, sublux, a subluxed hip. Now in ultrasound, you don't have this third category. You either have a centered hip or a decentered hip. And it's a combination of the morphological features and the angles that help you to make that clean distinction. So there are the, the main decentered hips we talk about are type three and type four. Uh, and this uh, difference is between whether the, um, the highline cartilage or the lateral edge of the acetabulum uh, its, its shape and how it's blocking the, the femoral head from coming back into the joint. There is uh, a type D, which is also a decentered hip. Um, uh, we could explain details of that uh, as we go along. Next. So the reason in our department and in many parts of the world, we, we've chosen a graph technique because it has significant uh, advantages over the other systems. It's got well-described guidelines the checklist one and two helps you to make reproduce, to get reproducible scans and use the system. It does not have gray zones uh, like in a clinical uh, examination or in one of the other systems where the femoral head coverage between certain ranges is not classed uh, into other. And it's the only system which takes into account the changing anatomy in the first 12 weeks of life. So you can make adjustments in your system for the age of the, of the, age of the baby. Thanks, next Sunday. So that's, that's why we've used this method in, in our ward. Next. Okay, so moving from the system that you use, just a brief talk about our hip screening in general, okay? Um, this is, you know, universal. So you could talk about clinical screening, selective screening, and universal screening. And this debate continues uh, even uh, in the system in the UK. Um, so we'll quickly look at, you know, why, um, how the three systems work and, and, and what are the limitations of each system. So clinical examination, you could argue that, you know, despite doing clinical examination in the UK from the 60s, we have not reduced the, the rate of late presenting DDH. So there could be many reasons why, why we would fail with using just this method for, for screening. It could be the technique, it could be the experience of the person um, carrying out the examination, and remember, the type 2C hip does not have clinical signs even in the most experienced hands. You could be doing this for 25, you could be doing this examination for 25 years, you will still miss type 2C hips. So clinical examination is never going to solve our problem of preventing all late presenting DDH. So then we get the help of ultrasound. Um, so in ultrasound, you have two options. You can do selective screening or you can do universal screening. Um, now in selective screening, you will only screen those babies that have risk factors. 
Now, we know from quite a few of the publications, and I'll cover a couple, that the, the, the patients that present with uh, DDH, only between 12 and 30% of these babies have risk factors. So if you use selective screening, you're only going to pick at most these 30% of cases. So the other 70%, you're not going to pick because they don't have risk factors. So again, however well you run your selective screening program plus your clinical screening program, you will still miss some babies. And if your aim is to uh, avoid late presenting DDH, then a combination of clinical examination and selective screening is not going to solve that for you. And that, there are, I'll show you a couple of uh, uh, presentations where that is now becoming quite apparent. And then we'll see the few countries in the world that have successfully gone on to use universal screening. Next. I'm not going to talk about swaddling because I think the next talk will cover that. So th this was a paper which essentially showed that relying purely on clinical examination is never going to be enough. 93% um, of um, what the, the clinician felt was subluxable or, or clicky were, were normal on the graph method. And equally, 26%, which were thought to be, the clinician thought was dislocated, were normal. Next. So like I said, all three systems, uh, all three clinical exams in selective and universal will reduce uh, your, uh, will help with the diagnosis and reduce your late presenting DDH, but to different degrees. Uh, and clearly you'd get your, your best results if you had universal screening. Next. Uh, so this was the paper from uh, Blackburn by, uh, by Patton, which said that only 30% of their dislocated hips had risk factors. Therefore, 70% were always going to be missed by selective screening. Next. Uh, this was a paper from Great Ormond Street in London, uh, and essentially in their paper, and this is a tertiary center which, which takes babies from a large area in, in the UK, uh, they felt that over five years, uh, looking at their 64 uh, cases, that their current screening practices were failing to eliminate late DDH. Next. So the first attempt at universal screening in the UK uh, was done uh, by John Clegg's team in Coventry. And he presented very good data, including financial uh, arguments to say we should proceed with, um, with universal screening. Uh, but for various political and other reasons, this uh, project did not carry on once uh, John Clegg uh, retired. Next. <laughs> So this is a, this is a good uh, collation of his results. Uh, and, and he diagnosed, uh, sorry, he defined late diagnosis as anything beyond three months of age. So when he was doing universal screening uh, between 2005 and 2008, his late uh, diagnosis rate for that population was 0.02%. And as soon as he retired and, and that process stopped, it jumped all, almost tenfold. And in the subsequent two years, it went up to 0.11%. Uh, next. So this was um, uh, the Austrian HIP uh, universal screening program, which compared two periods, five-year periods in Austria before and after introduction of the universal screening uh, system. And there was a 76% reduction in surgical intervention when babies were diagnosed early and treated early. Next. Uh, this is another comparison. If you looked at countries that use just clinical screening, and countries that use universal screening, you'll see the rate of major surgery per thousand live births. Uh, in Northern Ireland is 0.38, United Kingdom is 0.3, uh, Australia is 0.15, and then compare that with Austria, that's 0.04. You know, that's, you know, that's a huge difference uh, in, in major surgery, which however well done in, in the most experienced hands, always has morbidity uh, and, and really early diagnosis and early simple treatment, your, your results are always going to be better than if you have to do major reconstructive surgery. Next. Uh, next. Uh, I think the other big success in, currently in the world would be to look at the universal screening program in Mongolia. Now, Mongolia, uh, you, could, you could argue, has less resources than many other countries across the world, but they have successfully introduce a universal screening program. And at the moment, probably the best or, or the largest series uh, published uh, for universal screening comes from the group in Mongolia. 
Uh, and this is supported by, by two pediatricians from Switzerland who, who helped to set up this system. Um, next. Uh, so this, um, this was a, a editorial uh, recently, uh, which essentially said that uh, if we continue to do what we are currently doing, that is just using clinical screening and selective screening, we're never going to uh, stop or the late presenting DDHs. Uh, and they felt that once we had a safe, um, flexible uh, abduction or flexion of abduction or process, which did not have any significant avian rate, we need to change the way we uh, screen and treat DDH. Next. This was the paper uh, uh, from Southampton, uh, which essentially said that um, across 25 or 30 years, uh, we had made no difference to the late presenting DDH despite using selective screening. Uh, so essentially what I'm, try what I'm trying to say is hip ultrasound with the graph system, I'm not saying that all ultrasound examinations, however you do it are equal, if you use the very strict guidelines that are, that are set in the graph system to acquire a good quality images which meets checklist one, a good standardized plane which meets checklist two, then you will have a system that's uh, reproducible uh, and you will get a uh, good consistent diagnosis of, of this condition. Thanks, next. So I know we're uh, running to a set time. So I'll very briefly cover uh, the early DDS treatment uh, that's based on the graph method of diagnosis uh, and what we use in the department I work in. So, so the main goals of, I mean, this is just a simplified uh, statement for treatment of DDH and early DDH. What you want to do is one, reverse the pathoanatomy of the deformed joint, make full use of the ossification potential of the acetabulum and the femoral head growth so that the early treatment will give you as normal a uh, hip as possible. And at the same time, when you're doing this, you don't want to damage uh, the growth plate. We always talk about the growth plate or, of the, uh, or the avascular nexus of the femoral head as damage to the growth plate there. But we should also consider the growth plate at the lateral edge of the acetabulum. And you could take a view that every dysplastic hip that you see after DDH is damage the growth plate of the lateral edge of the acetabulum and, and therefore consider it as being sort of a vascular necrosis of that growth plate. And you want to avoid that in your treatment. Next. So here's uh, some original slides from Professor Graf's talk. Uh, and it shows you um, a, a decenter or dislocated hip, which is sitting outside the acetabulum and it's squashing the growth plate of the lateral edge of the acetabulum. Uh, someone needs to mute their uh, mic, please. Um, and then you can see when you add flexion and abduction, uh, the femoral head relocates into the acetabulum uh, and you can see the growth plate of the lateral edge of the acetabulum there. So I'm just checking that you can hear me and, and the screen's moving fine because I can't get any feedback. I can't see anyone else on the screen at the moment. Are you there? We can hear you loud and clear. Okay, okay. Yes, Thank you. all well. Yeah. <laughs> okay, great. Okay, so now uh, next we talk about you trying to use the ossification potential. Next. Next slide. Yeah, okay. So this is a graph that everyone who's involved with DDH will have seen. And essentially what you're trying to do is this really steep part of the curve where your acetabulum uh, re is developing. You want to catch your treatment early on uh, in you know, in that six, between two, month two and month four, so in that four to six week age, if you start treatment early there, you'll get the benefit of this, this rapid uh, development of the acetabulum that you get. Uh, and therefore you want to get the hip relocated early on. Next. And you want to avoid damage to the growth plate. So let's, I'll just say a couple of words about this. Again, these are original slides from Professor Graf. So we know, well, until we started doing ultrasound of the hip on a regular basis, certainly as a medical student, I was taught that the uh, hyaline cartilage of the femoral head and similarly the hyaline cartilage on the lateral edge of the acetabulum received its, its, nutri its uh, nutrition from di by diffusion from the synovial fluid. Because histology 
had shown us that there were no blood vessels in, in this hyaline cartilage. But you can see on that stain uh, uh, image on the left of the screen, those little spaces that you see in the cartilage, they are, they are sinusoids. Now the sinusoids are blood filled spaces without walls. And, and we, until we started doing ultrasound, we didn't know that the hyaline cartilage gets its nutrition from the blood that's flowing in this, in this hyaline cartilage. Uh, so that was one of the uh, you know, significant findings that we know about, which uh, still hasn't made it to the basic sciences books and, and medical uh, literature. Now, in, when uh, we talk a lot about the hyaline cartilage of the femoral head, but if you see the hyaline cartilage on the acetabular side, it also has sinusoids. And we want to avoid avascular necrosis of that cartilage as well, if you want good growth potential of the acetabulum. Uh, like I said, uh, John Clegg would often say in his lecture, you know, we, we all concentrate on avascular necrosis of the femoral head, but acetabular dysplasia in every baby of DDH is avascular necrosis of the lateral edge of the acetabulum. If you look at it like that, you'd, uh, you'd, you'd be much more careful in your treatment. Next. Okay, so here is the entire sequence uh, or spectrum uh, of DDH. I mean, we, in all um, pathology that we treat, uh, you know, it, it's a spectrum. You don't have specific groups. We divide pathology into various groups to make it easy for us to make a diagnosis and plan treatment. But essentially, um, all, all conditions are a spectrum. So if you go to the extreme uh, left of this slide, where you've got a normal, deep, uh, well-developed acetabulum uh, and a femoral head, which is well-located, and as you move towards the right of the screen, the acetabulum becomes a little shallow. You can see the, the angle or the depth of the acetabulum is, is changing. And then I've drawn that red line where at that point, a centered hip becomes a decentered hip. And then as, as the pathology progresses, uh, you get a type three and then a type four um, a graph hip. So, what we want to do is we want to reverse the pathology and, and head, uh, get the, this early hip to head back to the normal uh, anatomy. Next. So three steps, very simplistically. Uh, if you have a decentered hip, you have to reduce it. You have to do something to retain it in that position. And then you have to let that hip mature till it forms back uh, a type one hip. Next. Um, so this is just, showing the same thing you need to reduce if it's decentered you need to reduce it and then you need to keep it there and you need to wait till it matures um so your reduction can be done um you hopefully if you if you diagnose things early you're not going to have to do a surgical open reduction but you do a closed reduction uh, next and across the world there are numerous ways of doing this this closed reduction you can do it manually uh with with the baby when you examine them um, in clinic or under an anesthetic, if you're going to uh, apply a hip spiker, you can use traction. There are, there are places in the world that use uh, traction and slow, slow flexion and abduction to achieve that reduction. And certainly in my practice, we tend to use a pavlic harness uh, as a method of, um, of obtaining the initial reduction and maintaining it there. Uh, and you want to have your hips flexed and abducted uh, you don't want extreme abduction or extreme flexion because they have um, their their own uh, complications. So the device that you use will depend on where where you're working in the world, and and there are forty or fifty different types of flexion abduction devices across the world. Next. So then, once you've reduced it, you need this period of initial retention. Now, you probably need to retain the hip uh, for that initial um, three to four weeks. Uh, and again, here, there are uh, various devices that people use for retention. Uh, after the initial reduction, you might use using uh, the pavlic harness as the first picture. You can use a short uh, hip spiker uh, that's holding the hip at around 90 to 100 degrees of flexion and about 45 degrees of abduction. Or you can use a, a full hip spiker all the way down uh, to the ankles. Uh, and in different places, different departments will use uh, different methods, but essentially, you need to hold that, that retention after you've reduced it. Next. So this is again, just showing you if, if, you, if, you, if you use pure abduction, you will still get this hazelnut shaped femoral head to catch on, the, on that lateral edge of the acetabulum. 
and therefore you have to use flexion and abduction to get it uh, well located uh, and as deep into the astrum as possible. Thanks. So this is historically a very old uh, hip spike. I think it's from the 70s. This is showing far too much abduction and you're going to risk AVN if you use plasters like this. This is just a historical slide of what you should not do. Next. Uh, this is what you really want to do. You want to have the flexion and the abduction uh, to get that hip well located. Thanks. Uh, occasionally, yeah, even with early diagnosis, if your, if your hip does not respond to, to treatment of the pelvic harness, uh, then you would have to do an EUA arthrogram and a close reduction. Um, and our cutoff for continuing to use a pelvic harness is two weeks. So if after two weeks of using a pelvic harness, the hip is not centered, uh, then we will uh, stop treatment of the pelvic harness and, and switch to a close reduction um, and a hip spiker. And I think these are slides just showing you a right-sided type four, left-sided type three hip, uh, which was reduced. And then four weeks after that, we, uh, you have, you know, the, the anatomy there has changed significantly and the hips are well uh, located. Next. So the, once you've reduced and retained this, then you need to, you need to ha have your hip held in flexion abduction and allow the hip to mature till it, it turns back to a type one hip. Uh, next. So we've talked about the various abduction devices available. And eventually this is what you want to achieve. So the picture on the, on the left is a decentered hip uh, and you want to locate it early, put it in a public harness, let it mature and become a type one hip. It's the same baby uh, on the right. So early diagnosis, simple treatment will help you. Swaddling uh, is to be avoided. I won't say much more about it as I think, uh, I think Alex is going to talk about it. Thanks, next. So that's just a summary. If you wanted to simplistically uh, put early management of, of the hip based on your uh, graph system, uh, uh, type one's in, type one's a normal hip, uh, type two is a centered hip, so you'd only need to let it mature. It's the decentered hips, which are the D three and four that you need to reduce, retain, and then hold till they become mature type one hips. Next. Okay. so. This is just a summary slide of what, I, what I've said so far. And often uh, where we've talked about treat, or treatment, people ask for very specifics of how you, know, how you manage uh, a certain type, how often do you screen them, when is your follow-up scan, what do you do? So this next slide, which if you can shift Sandeep, is a very, it could look like a very complicated slide, but essentially this is our department's treatment protocol. And if you want this, I'm very happy for Sandeep to, to give it out to you. It's not something you can read on this screen here, but essentially it's, it's the protocol that our juniors will follow. So if you have um, you know, uh, a type 2A, then you're gonna rescan in X number of weeks and, and the treatment and the further follow-up right up to uh, skeletal maturity is covered in this. So I'll, I'm very happy for you to share that with anyone who wants it. Thanks, next. Okay. Uh, that's very briefly um, my overview of, of how we use the graph system, why, we, why we've chosen it. We are at a time where we're using uh, selective screening. We would like to have universal screening, but there, we have a few political hurdles and, and support we need to get through before we can get there. Anyway, thanks a lot for inviting me to speak today, Sandeep, uh, and I hope Thank um, you. it's been useful. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Sandeep. That was a nice overview of... Uh how efficient the graph method is and how you have successfully implemented it. And we'll need your help, both Professor Graf and Sandeep, because we are in the process of developing our own guidelines and we need to trade our sonologists as well as the young pediatric orthopedic surgeons. So I'm sure Alvik would get in touch with you, who's the president of POSI now. Maybe we could do another graph course soon, sooner than later, so that we refresh ourselves as we go into the new era of uh, early diagnosis and screening. Before I hand over to Alaric, uh, I would just ask Sally to make uh, a few comments about joy and screening because she needs to leave. Thank you very much, Sandeep. And thank you, Dipti, and all of you for inviting me to join you. Um, 
1987, I had the great good fortune to meet Professor Graf. Um, I had been struggling with hip ultrasound. I'm a radiologist. And as far as I was concerned, none of the other methods that I had tried were able to give me a reproducible hip ultrasound. And I had the great good fortune to meet Professor Graf and understand that first you have to learn the anatomy and secondly, you have to learn how to obtain a standardized view in a simple reproducible way. Um, I started running hip courses with the help of Professor Graf in Dorchester in 1989. John Clegg, who was an orthopedic surgeon from Coventry, joined us as part of our faculty. And in the early 2000s, he said to me, please may I bring my friend Joy Patanka from India to one of the courses. And I was delighted that Joy came. And when I met Joy, his interest, his enthusiasm, not only his enthusiasm, but his ability to undertake effective action became very apparent. The other thing that was extremely apparent was his great love of India. Joy then invited Professor Graf and myself to come to India, to come to the Sanchetti Institute in Pune for the first Indian hip ultrasound course. And we were warmly welcomed. And then because Joy had us, inverted commas, captive, he asked us to go on to the polio corrective surgery camp. Um, Joy had his enthusiasms, but he also was an extremely effective organizer and organizer of courses and organizer of people. And in the most charming way, he could persuade one to do what he felt would benefit the population and him. And so I joined um, in the polio camp. And, and then um, I also at that time met his lovely family. Um, and the polio camps were not only to provide an amazing service to rural populations, but Joy's idea was to instill the whole idea of voluntary work in young doctors. Um, tragically, Joy died much too young. Um, but he has left a legacy in the polio camps and in the teaching of innumerable students. And also we have at the moment the great joy of having his younger daughter, Nikki, doing a fellowship in orthopedic surgery in our hospital in Poole. And so she is carrying on the family tradition. And she is like Joy, enthusiastic, motivated, and an excellent communicator. And it has been to me a great privilege and a great joy to have the association with India that was started by Joy. And we all still miss him. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sally, for your comments and your help uh, throughout the years. So I think I will hand over the uh, presentation now to Dr. Alaric, president of POSI, to talk about the great strides that we've made in getting an Indian uh, hip screening program going. I'll record to you. Thank you so much, uh, Sandeep and uh, Deepti, for inviting me to this wonderful webinar organized by the IOA Pediatric Subcommittee 
uh, in honor of Joy and the wonderful legacy he has left us. My interaction with Joy began more than 25 years ago as a young orthopedic surgeon when uh, I joined my training at KEM Hospital. And my interaction with Joy was, of course, immediately one of admiration. Not only did he have a wonderful personality and a booming voice, but what really impressed us a lot was the fact that he had this very childlike curiosity to question the existing paradigms and always learn something new. He was always on this constant search for something new in terms of diagnosis, in terms of treatment, whether there were new concepts or, or new instrumentation. And really his untimely passing was a big blow to the orthopedic fraternity and to us personally who looked up to him as a teacher, a mentor, a friend and a philosopher. And I'm so glad that today we have this opportunity to honor his legacy as a teacher and a friend and to talk about a topic that was really close to his heart, which is about the early diagnosis and the management of uh, developmental hip dysplasia. Over the last couple of years, we have, uh, as an organization, which is uh, the Pediatric Orthopedic Society of India, really worked hard to look into ways to develop a screening program that is specific for our Indian healthcare system. While we understand the importance of universal screening, not always does uh, this work in uh, countries with limited resources. And therefore, we felt it was essential to look at guidelines which are effective but also practical from the Indian healthcare system point of view. So over the next few minutes, I'll share with some of you the, uh, the process that we undertook to develop these guidelines, taking these guidelines from concept to reality. It's been shown well before in the previous talk that DDH is a spectrum of conditions ranging from very mild dysplasia at one end of the spectrum to a completely dislocated hip at the other end. And while we know and we speak of the incidence of DDH being one in thousand, this of course uh, underestimates the true prevalence and the incidence of DDH. We know that clinical hip instability is far more common. It's seen about one to three percent of all neonates. And if you perform an ultrasound, you'll find that there's hip dysplasia seen in a very high percentage of around 5 to 15 percent. The good news is that almost 80 percent of these resolve spontaneously and it's the remaining 20 percent that we need to pick up so that they don't present as uh, late uh, or delayed presenting DDH. I think it's important to look at the incidence of DDH through the lens of common birth defects and while we know that congenital heart disease is one of the commonest congenital anomalies that a child could be born with, we know that incidence of DDH is not any less. In fact, it is higher than some of the visually apparent congenital defects, such, such as a club foot, which many of us can diagnose quite easily. Furthermore, it's not a condition that is only seen in the West that was commonly believed. We know that several studies from India have shown us quite clearly that the incidence of DDH is uh, probably the same or even higher than what is, what is seen or reported in Western literature. This has also been spoken before that the diagnosis of DDH uh, is, uh, of course, using clinical parameters. But we all know that these are the mo not the most accurate tests. While they can pick up a, a, a major hip dislocation, milder cases of acetabular dysplasia are often missed by many of these clinical tests. We know that an ultrasound has been shown by Sandeep to be one of the best methods to pick up even mild grades of hip dysplasia. But whether it can be used as a universal diagnostic tool in all healthcare systems is the moot point. X-rays we know are not very good as a screening tool in the early neonatal period, but of course becomes very useful as the child grows older, especially over the age of three or four months. Whatever the method of diagnosis of DDH, we know that early screening uh, is, will, will help in early effective treatment. We know that if it's picked up before the age of six months, it can be treated quite easily with the pavlic harness, later on with the hip spiker. However, in situations like ours in low resource countries, we know that late presenting DDH is still a fairly common problem. And while it can be tackled with, uh, with various reconstructive procedures, 
we know that this is often fraught with a high rate of complications, including re-dislocation, avascular necrosis, growth disturbances of the proximal femur and acetabulum, and even stiffness. Besides, these are expensive surgeries, and they are always not the best way to go in terms of management of a condition like DDH. If you look at the various criteria set up by the WHO for screening of various health conditions to see whether they fit into the screening concept, we immediately understand that DDH ticks all of those boxes in the checklist. There have, of course, been various national and regional hip screening programs of DDH developed and adopted in several parts of the world. But such programs meet the needs of the local populations and the healthcare systems and may not always be transferable to developing countries and countries with limited resources. Whatever the method of screening has been shown that there's a marked reduction in the incidence of late presenting DDH and is the standard of care globally. So here you can see that we have already screening guidelines established by the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons and the American Academy of Pediatrics. And many of the practitioners who work in these high resource countries have adopted these guidelines into their practice. But how are these guidelines applicable to a country like India? We know that there's a poor awareness about DDH among pediatricians and allied healthcare professionals. While we understand that ultrasound is one of the best diagnostic tools to screen for DDH, we know that the availability and expertise in our country is only available in a few urban centers in major cities. And this is often because of the very stringent preconception prenatal diagnostic techniques act that has been enforced in India uh, to curb the female feticide. We also know that if children get through screening, there's no structured surveillance to detect late cases. And there's little benefit in teaching early diagnosis if there's no pathway for referral after the initial diagnosis is made. I don't need to belabor this point for us Indians. We know that we are the second most populous country in the world, and with an annual birth rate of 26 million, we, we know that the estimated incidence of, D, of DDH is about 25,000 new cases per year. We know that a very small amount of our GDP is allocated to healthcare. There's a lack of shortage, there's a lack of infrastructure and a shortage of doctors in the rural areas where 70% of the population lives. And we have this very unusual dichotomous healthcare system where more than 50% of the healthcare, even in the rural areas, and about 70% in the urban areas, is provided by the private sector. So we realized since several years that something needs to be done in order to create some specific screening guidelines which would be specific for India. And uh, a couple of years back, just before the COVID pandemic struck, we decided to liaise with some important national organizations which deal with child healthcare, especially the Indian Academy of Pediatrics and the National Neonatology Forum. We form partnerships with many of these organizations, and these organizations represent approximately 120,000 healthcare professionals in India, which speak to the scope of where these guidelines would go once they're fully implemented across the country. We use a scientific approach of creating four pillars for developing this pathway based upon creating awareness among the stakeholders, looking at the existing evidence from literature, building consensus where evidence was lacking, and finally looking at various knowledge translation tools that could be developed to implement these guidelines across the country. So we used a three-phased approach, which we reported in one of our journals a couple of years ago, looking at the first stage of preparatory phase where we, bring, where we brought the various stakeholders together and conducted an informal literature review to familiarize the group with the existing literature and the Delphi process. We then underwent the Delphi survey, which looked to develop consensus where literature is lacking. And finally, we had a core writing group, which actually wrote the guidelines based upon the consensus developed through the Delphi approach. And I'll go through each of these in some detail. So in the phase one, which will last about four months, we brought together this multidisciplinary expert group to first create awareness about the magnitude and the incidence of, of DDH across the country. In the second phase, which also lasted four months, we developed a set of consensus statements using this evidence from literature and consensus building using the modified Delphi approach. With this, we reached about 35 final statements in three phases of the Delphi approach 
which then ultimately helped us in writing up the guidelines. This is a very busy slide and I don't expect you to read it, but the statements covered important aspects of clinical examination, the use of ultrasound and x-rays as a screening tool, the, the decision-making process which is involved in the diagnosis and further management of DDH, and finally about the risk factor screening. In the last phase, we finally framed the guidelines by a co-writing team and then started working on the development of knowledge translation tools and other derivative products for the active dissemination of these guidelines across the country. So this is a snapshot of the care, of the care pathway that we have developed. It is available on the POSI website. If you point your camera towards this QR code, you'll be able to go to the POSI website, which takes you to the entire development a process of the guidelines and the algorithm that was developed. And while it does look a little busy, it's actually a very simple algorithm that all of us orthopedic surgeons can incorporate into our practice. We've also published this in the Indian Journal of Pediatrics, which is the official journal of the IAP for the use by pediatricians and neonatologists all over the country. So what is unique about the guidelines that we have developed? We've developed guidelines which are relevant to the Indian healthcare context, made in India for India. It's broad-based enough to remain applicable to the diversity of India's healthcare settings, both for the public as well as the private healthcare sector. The focus here is on surveillance rather than screening, which emphasizes the concept of periodic examination rather than trying to detect DDH at a single episode. And more importantly, what we have done is to align DDA screening with the national immunization schedule, which brings in millions of children per year into the Well Baby Clinic for vaccinations from birth to, the, to five years of age. We also have eight specific clinical tests for children less than three months, between three months to six months of age, and more than six months of age. And while we understand that universal ultrasound is the way to go to pick up even the smallest cases of late presenting DDH, we know that uh, in a country like ours, where we have a limitation of availability and expertise in interpreting hip ultrasound in infants because of the stringent pcp Act, we have recommended only a selective use of hip ultrasound. And we also therefore permit x-rays to be used for screening at an earlier age of 14 weeks due to a lack of the ultrasound availability. So very briefly, if I can take you through this algorithm, the basis of our screening program still focuses on universal clinical examination. As much as we know that the diagnostic accuracy of clinical examinations is only 70%, it would at least help us to diagnose the graph three and the graph four hips. And the minimum clinical tests that we are requesting pediatricians and neonatologists to perform are the Ortolani and the Barlow test for children less than 14 weeks of age and limited hip abduction, the Galeazzi and the limb length discrepancy signs for children aged more than 14 weeks. If these tests are positive, the child should be referred immediately to a pediatric orthopedic or a general orthopedic surgeon for evaluation for the treatment. If clinical tests are negative, that does not mean everything is fine. The child is then subjected to risk factor screening. So if you look at risk factor screening, we have looked at four specific, uh, which are uh, evidence-based uh, risk factors for the incidence of DDH, which are breach presentation, a positive family history, a history of improper swaddling, and a history of previous hip instability. And if any of these risk factors are present, we then look at the age of the child. If the child is less than three months of age and quality ultrasound is available, we, we schedule an ultrasound at six weeks. If we don't have ultrasound available, we schedule an AP pelvis X-ray at 14 weeks when the child comes for the second vaccination visit. And if it's abnormal, we refer the child to an orthopedic surgeon. If the risk factor screening is negative, the child can return to routine hip surveillance. An important subgroup in the screening pathway is a positive Barlow test. We know that in a child less than six weeks, hip instability may still resolve. And therefore, uh, we only schedule an ultrasound after six weeks of age, or an AP pelvis X-ray at 14 weeks if ultrasound is not available. But a positive Barlow indicating hip instability after six weeks of age is definitely abnormal, and therefore the child should be referred to an orthopedic surgeon right away. So this in short is a snapshot of what we want to achieve from our hip screening pathway. The final phase of our 
uh, pathway process is now looking at implementation and knowledge translation and to find various methods by which we can popularize the screening all across the country. And I'm very thankful that through the effort of the Indian Orthopedic Association conducting webinars like this, we can reach many more orthopedic surgeons who can then communicate with their colleagues who are pediatricians and neonatologists to implement these screening programs uh, within their practice. So we have developed certain knowledge translation tools in the form of various graphics and pictures to explain the various clinical tests that should be done at an age appropriate manner for diagnosis of DDH up to the age of six months to a year. So in conclusion, what I would say is that the various lessons that we have learned by developing these screening guidelines uh, in a process that lasted almost a year, we understood that just developing guidelines by a small team of core orthopedic surgeons and then uh, leaving it out to the pediatricians to implement would never work. We knew that we need to involve all the relevant stakeholders right from the beginning to enhance buy-in. And I think that's what we managed to achieve because I think many of these guidelines are now being implemented by pediatricians and neonatologists in their, in their practice settings. We understood the various potential barriers in building knowledge and awareness. We understood that it's not just enough to take an existing pathway, which may, be, which may work in developing countries, like in the German-speaking countries or in various parts of Europe, but, but in fact, modify those guidelines to our existing healthcare system and develop care pathways which are context-specific, thinking globally, but acting locally. We also understood that uh, when you want to achieve guidelines, it's important to follow a feasible, multi-phase and evidence-based approach to guidelines development, because only a scientific rigor would stand the test of time. We know that it's important to match knowledge translation and implementation strategies to identify barriers by considering the support of local champions, leadership of various organizations, outreach programs, and the role of the government as well to take this forward in the public sector. And having developed these guidelines now, we are trying to pay it forward by uh, incorporating them into the healthcare system of other countries who have approached us who have a similar healthcare system. Notably, we are trying to now alliance with the uh, Sri Lankan Orthopedic Association and the Pediatric uh, Society to develop similar guidelines for Sri Lanka and also in talks with uh, Bangladesh, um, uh, Pakistan, and the Middle East. So finally, I would like to acknowledge all the members of our DDH expert group, which came from seven different organizations who worked really hard over the span of a year to help develop these guidelines. And I would be remiss if I didn't acknowledge the funding support and the collaborations we developed with our international collaborators from the University of, of British Columbia, uh, Kishore Mulpuri and his team from the BC Children's Hospital. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for the wonderful presentation, Alric. I think uh, it's a great uh, step forward in the, uh, on the, I would say the fight against DDH. And I think Professor Graf had to leave, but I would have really loved him to comment on our uh, efforts as well as guidelines. Maybe Dr. Ashok Johari sir can uh, show us the way forward and maybe Scali can uh, make a comment on the work that is done. Before we move on to Dr. Jari's talk on the surgical algorithm for Indian patients. Well, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, I think a beginning has been made. India is a massive, massively big country. And the problems are very, very different from the well-developed countries in the West, you know. So creating awareness, letting people know how to screen for DDH, how to detect DDH, I think these are important parts of the whole program. So right now, I think I must uh, definitely appreciate all the efforts which have gone in. Uh, but of course, it's, it's going to be a hard battle, you know, uh, to reduce the incidence of uh, late dislocations and late presentation of dislocations in this country. We have made a start and uh, that is commendable. Over to Sally. Any comments, Sally? I think that you have put so much thought and into the and looked at so many different aspects that these are is an excellent start. 
Um, I fully appreciate the problems that India faces in size of population, in the large rural areas, the lack of general ultrasound. Um, and so I think that the first step of increasing awareness is uh, and increasing the ability to do the physical examination is extremely valuable. Um, and in due course, I would hope that ultrasound will become more easily available as ultrasound machines become cheaper and more portable. And, um, I, but I do think that the work that has been done to set up a screening program uh, and to raise awareness is excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words. I think we are still seeing a lot of uh, walking children with uh, DDH and who better than Dr. Johari to give us a sur surgical algorithm because we still have to do a lot of reconstructive surgery. So over to you, sir, for your uh, presentation on the surgical approach and an algorithm for walking children. Well, thank you, Sandeep. Uh, I would like to start by paying a tribute to my young colleague. This is a tribute to a free and joyous spirit. It is said that in a garden, the most beautiful flowers are plucked and offered to God. You know. Joy left early, but the message he gave all of us was, what's important is not the years in your life, but the life in your years. I'm going to be speaking on the surgical management algorithm across ages. I would like to start with this preamble, you know, and I think it has been emphasized. I would like to emphasize this again, that the best time to detect DDH is at birth. Early treatment is simpler with better outcomes. Unfortunately, we have a very heterogeneous society. And we still have a lot of late presentations. So surgery is required in many of these cases. So in order to understand surgery, we need to understand the pathoanatomy of DDH. That's very, very important. The problems in DDH, the femoral head has gone high. We need to lower the femoral head. We need to bring the femoral head in the center of the acetabulum. So we need a well-centered reduction. And we need the femoral head to be covered by the cartilaginous acetabulum. So we need a well-covered central capital femoral epiphysis. That's important. What happens when DDH is left alone is muscle shortening. Because the femoral head has gone up, the pelvic femoral muscles become tight. Then there are problems with the capsule, you know, which actually travels a long way and which gets adherent in this particular path. Lastly, there are adaptive bony changes in the femoral head and also acetabular changes. So muscle shortening is the first thing we need to deal with. The pelvic femoral muscles, which are the hip flexors, the adductors, the abductors, as well as the extensors of the hip, all become tight because the femoral head has gone high. The remedy for this is, of course, we can release the adductors, you can do a psoas tenotomy. When we talk of surgery, all this can be done. You know. The abductor can be released partially from the iliac crest. But for the hamstrings, which are the hip extensors, you require to do what is known as the femoral shortening. The hamstrings are tackled by means of femoral shortening. By femoral shortening, we mean that when the femoral head is sitting in the acetabulum, and you apply gentle traction to the extremity, there's the overlap between the two fragments. This overlap needs to be taken off so that pressure on the femoral head is minimized. The right upper pane shows you the degree of overlap which is present in this particular patient, which is more than four centimeters. So the amount by which the femoral head has gone above the acetabulum, we need to shorten the femur to be able to reduce the stresses on the femoral head. Femoral shortening allows lowering of the femoral head. It allows a better reduction of the femoral head. 
it reduces pressure on the femoral head, lowering the rate of avascular necrosis. The other barriers to a concentric reduction, of course, extraarticular, which was already mentioned, but ileus was in particular because it constricts the capsule. As the femoral head goes higher, the ileus was actually moves more laterally and it always sort of impinges on the capsule, creating a constriction. So this tendon of ileus was is very important in the pathoanatomy of DDH. There are intraarticular obstacles. The ligamentum teres becomes thick and hypertrophied. The labrum actually inverts. The pulvina becomes large hypertrophies. And the transverse ligament, which is the inferior part of the acetabular region, it's in the inferior acetabular region, inferior part of the capsule, actually moves up and contracts. You know, It moves up and contracts, narrowing the opening to the acetabular. And this needs to be tackled. So we need to excise the ligamentum teres in most cases. We need to evert the labrum. We need to excise the pulvina. And we need to release the transverse ligament. So that's the ligamentum teres. And that is excised. And that pulvinar hypertrophy, you can see the capsule is marked. And you're looking at the acetabular. The pulvinar is very, very hypertrophic. And this needs to be taken off to allow place for the femoral head. Capsule itself in DDH and in late presentations of DDH, because of the head migrating, capsule can get adherent in different places. So it can get adherent to the iliac wing. It can constrict as is shown on the right side pain. There is a constriction of the capsule or the capsule can get adherent inferiorly, blocking the entry to the acetabulum. Both these situations will block the entry to the acetabulum. So adhesions of the capsule can be superior Posterior, there can be inferior infolding, or it could be perikephalic. All around the head, it can be attached, or it could be stomach. So we need to lower the capsule. We need to bring it to the edge of the acetabulum. We need to divide the capsule and separate it from the head and all the adhesions which are present. If your capsule is large and there is redundancy, we need to do a repair of that capsule by means of a capsule or apple. Then there are bony changes in the femoral head and in the acetabulum. Both places, there are changes. Briefly, these changes are change in the head shape. This may give you an unstable reduction. Increased antiversion of the femoral head. Increased valgus of the upper femur. Increased antiversion of the acetabulum. And an increased slope of the acetabulum. At the upper end of the femur, generally you have a Increase valgus and an increase antiversion. And that is why we require a varus derotation osteotomy. More often, this is a rotational problem and a rotational osteotomy is required. So here you can see this example on the CT scan. The femoral head points in direction of the patella. There's a marked antiversion of the femoral head and femoral head neck. That's the upper portion of the femur. And this will have to be corrected to normal. The acetabulum also can antivert a lot. And that also would need correction by a pelvic osteotomy. In the acetabulum itself, you have an increasing slope, increasing antiversion, and a diminished depth of the acetabulum. And for all these bony changes, we need to derotate the upper femur in a controlled way. We need to give an adequate varus of the upper femur. We need to retrovert the acetabulum again in a controlled way, or you would have newer problems. We need to restore the slope of the acetabulum or the acetabular index. We need to restore the depth of the acetabulum so that the femoral head can sit quite deeply inside the acetabulum. Now, how to reduce the hip surgically and what is a good reduction? We need to restore the anatomy to as normal as possible. We need to take care of all extra and intraarticular obstacles. And femoral and acetabular anatomy has to be restored to as near normal as is possible. So when do we do an open reduction and how do we do it? When you have failure of a closed reduction or a situation where open reduction has failed, one would again need to resort to an open reduction. Now, when do we do a pure open reduction? When we assess the reduction in the neutral position, the hip is well contained and stable. You may not need to do anything more than an open reduction. 
So here's an example. I've taken this old example because there is a follow-up at the end of the lecture. This child failed flow reduction, had an open reduction, a temporary K wire, required a femoral shortening because of the increased back pressure which was there on the femoral head. So a femoral shortening was done. This is way back in 2005. And then a plate fixation. This is when the plaster was removed, well healed, well contained. A year later, that is the situation on the right. The child was then lost to follow up. And I will present to you what happens 11 years later. That is in 2017, when the child presents back. Now, sometimes we need to do a femoral osteotomy when the hip becomes stable in the neutral position with the femur in abduction or internal rotation greater than 20 degrees. Now, also there will be other factors to guide your judgment. For example, the degree of acetabular dysplasia. It is more than one would do this for a lesser angle. If the acetabulum is fairly competent, one needs to just correct so that the hip can be held stable in the neutral position. So here's an example of a child. You see the marked acetabular dysplasia which is present. This child had an open reduction and a femoral osteotomy. This was way back in 94, I think. Yes. And this is 10 years later. The hip has developed well, 10 years post-operative. The picture is shown here. And that's the function. The function is very good, excellent. And this is at the age of 20 years, nearly 17 years after the initial surgery. That's the situation. So femoral osteotomy is required where you need to properly center the femoral head. We need to overcome the femoral deformity, but avoid overcorrection. And the best results are generally when the C angle at the beginning is 0 to 10 degrees after you have had a reduction. The C angle should be at least about 10 degrees and the acetabular index of 20 to 35. If the acetabulum is markedly dysplastic, you would need to do an acetabular procedure. We come to the acetabulum now. So it has an increasing slope, increasing antiversion, diminished depth. So there is a, usually a superolateral deficiency. So we need to do open reduction with acetabular procedure when acetabular dysplasia is present, though the hip is stable in neutral position after an open reduction. So acetabular dysplasia is marked, one would need to do a acetabular procedure. These are generally done by means of redirectional osteotomies or acetabuloplasties or augmentation by means of shelf or chiari based on the individual situation. We are more fond of the Degas procedure, which is an acetabuloplasty where the pelvic roof is opened up. You know, this is supraacetabular. The roof is opened up there with a distractor and the graft is packed in from the femur. Generally, these grafts are from the femoral shortening and one can see the restoration of the horizontality of the acetabular roof. Now, sometimes we need to do open reduction with femoral and acetabular procedures. So this is done when the hip is stable in neutral position with femur in abduction, internal rotation of greater than 20 degrees and acetabular dysplasia is present, which is unlikely to completely remodel, so depending on the age of the child. So this is a four-year-old where a dega and a femoral osteotomy is done. This is a seven years old, marked acetabular dysplasia, dislocated hip, has a femoral and acetabular procedure with good restitution. Now, when we do all these procedures together, it's called a one-stage surgery. So we have a one-stage surgery of open reduction, femoral shortening, virus or rotation osteotomy, derotation osteotomy, and a pelvic osteotomy. So bone procedure. What we need to do is to do the femoral osteotomy, lower the femoral head into a concentric reduction, excise the overlapping bone, so that is the femoral shortening. We fix the distal fragment neutrally if pelvic osteotomy is not required, and we check the stability. If pelvic procedure is required, we do it before fixing the femur. Congruent reduction is a must. We have anterior coverage, salters, or a double or triple osteotomy. Postal superior coverage, degas, large acetabulum, we do a Pemberton's, and salvage procedures if reduction is not congruous. So here's an 11 year old. You can see his date. He presented in 2014. He had pain in the hip joint. And you can see that the gait is markedly antalgic.
he presented for surgery in fact two years later so that was his uh, x-ray in 2015 when he was 12 years old bilateral ddh see the amount of exaggerated lordosis of the spine and then 13 years old he had this bilateral surgery so 2015 or 16 he had this surgery this is his function after the surgery functionally he is good and that's his gait after this procedure is done so this is about a year or so later after the procedure is done this is after two or three years of uh, the surgery now advantages of one stage surgery shorter hospitalization lower incidence of avascular necrosis and low incidence of redislocation mm -hmm. the post operative management generally in such cases is immobilization in spiker for 6 weeks then we mobilize the joint we do muscle strengthening partial weight bearing to full weight bearing is started gradually so when we talk of dds surgery this is my checklist in terms of reduction we do adducted tenotomy a psoas tenotomy resection of redundant capsule excision of ligamentum teres this is the surgical marking anterior approach and the lateral approach for the femur sort of anterior lateral lateral approaches here and the head of rectus is reflected from the top of the iliac wing is seen the capsule is there and this rectus femoris is reflected the psoas tendon is identified in the field and that is cut generally it constricts the capsule the capsule can be seen very clearly now so that's that is the capsular region the femoral head on cutting the capsule uh, now this is a late presentation you can see the changes in the femoral head so we remove the fibrofatty tissue at the pulvina we divide the transverse ligament we divide all the capsular adhesions to the femoral head and ilium and a femoral shortening is done so that's the femoral shortening and then the head is in the way to reduction in the acetabulum we do a capsular rapi a rsd rotation osteotomy as is required acetabular realignment or an augmentation whatever is necessary so that's the acetabulum supra acetabular area being cut and jacked open and the bone graft which is packed in for a degas procedure the acetabulum is somewhere near the retractor below the retractor actually on the left side so when we talk of decision making you know and uh, how to manage across the ages there are a lot of preoperative considerations higher the age more will be the secondary changes and there will be an age beyond which you really can't tackle these surgically because of the marked secondary changes now is the condition unilateral or bilateral what are the symptoms you know is it painful then what has been the previous treatment what has been the function and the range of motion again station shape size and sphericity of the femoral head is important femoral antiversion neck shaft angle and articular trochanteric distance has to be considered shape size and degree of acetabular dysplasia and acetabular deficiency has to be considered on table decision making would involve releasing all the soft tissue obstruction which is preventing the open reduction muscle releases femoral procedure femoral shortening varus and d rotation you need to decide need and type of acetabular procedure and stability assessment in the neutral position so here is the line diagram which shows you this is from a, my, my book chapter here ddh open reduction indications of femoral shortening is a tight reduction whatever may be the age definitely is required beyond the age of 3 years varus d rotation osteotomy required is required when there is extreme of abduction and internal rotation and a pelvic procedure is generally done for acetabular dysplasia usually marked acetabular dysplasia which is unlikely to remodel with a open reduction or with a open reduction and a femoral osteotomy now sometimes we have these late presentations of adolescent um, dysplasia this is the patient i showed you who had a open reduction in 2005 they disappeared for 11 years never came back presented with a painful right hip you know the acetabular dysplasia is present she's 16 years old now treated at age of 2 years with open reduction and femoral osteotomy what can we do in this sort of a situation well 
the MRI shows you actually the lower pain you see the labrum is disorganized. It's it's sort of um, in a mess and the acetabulum markedly sloping upward and the femoral head going out. And this is shown on the CT scan. More than half the femoral head is uncovered. And this sort of situation, one would need a more radical procedure like a PAO, periacetabular osteotomy, along with a femoral osteotomy to ensure a good reduction in coverage. This is 2018, follow up, follow up three years later, just three years post up. So concerns with older DDH, upper age, Surgical experience is mandatory if you have to tackle older cases of DDH, you know, and there's an the upper age limit beyond which even the most experienced surgeon will fail because of the secondary changes which are present. These are anatomic changes leading to compromised surgical outcome and ability to achieve a concentric reduction. There will be complications, long-term problems of satisfactory function and um, progress. In. So, in ending, I would like to say that open reduction of a dislocated hip in a child has to last a lifetime. Arthroplasty people, joint arthroplasty, total joint arthroplasty talk of 5, 10, 15 years follow-up. We have to talk of 60-year follow-up, 65, 75-year follow-up. Hence, this surgery is to be taken very, very seriously. There's hardly any element um, where you can be careless because you have to do your best and get it right the first time. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. That was absolutely a brilliant talk on the surgical algorithms. If there are any questions, Taral, Alaric, I think uh, we can get them clarified for the benefit of everybody who's watching. And I would like to start by asking, sir, uh, looking at uh, the... Uh, uh, Astabular procedures and the complexity of these, uh, how early would you advocate doing an astabular procedure, especially to the younger pedipods? Because there is a, a very large tendency of having a radiological correction by doing very early pelvic surgery rather than a good open reduction and capsulography. Uh, what is your take on this? Or should you wait if there is residual Astabular dysplasia and then tackle it when the bone stopped and your experience and expertise is a little better. Actually, there are different cases and they behave differently, you know, based on there might be genetic factors which influence acetabular dysplasia. We don't know. You know. Our logical expectation is if the patient comes early, presents early, and we have done a good surgery, the femoral head is inside the acetabulum, it is well centered, you know, and the joint is stable, which means the femoral indices are okay. The acetabulum will remodel you, but this does not necessarily happen in every case. There are some reasons we don't understand, some reasons may be surgical, because we have a typical tendency to think in terms of two dimension or one dimension. You know, we really don't know what is happening in all the dimensions of the acetabulum. You know. So my practice in these cases is to watch this patient serially, you know, and they have to follow up you know, with me. I see how the acetabular dysplasia is resolving. You know, if the acetabular dysplasia is resolving, that's very good. If the acetabular dysplasia remains static over a period of time, you know, followed up six months, six months later, another six months, one and a half year, two years, it's static. You know, I would like to offer acetabular surgery at an early age. You know, and uh, sometimes it happens that I showed you a patient who just went away after the open reduction, followed up for a year. We really can have problems uh, without a follow-up, you know, knowing what is happening to these patients. So follow-up becomes very, very important in these cases you know, for different reasons, you know, whether it's the growth of the femur, coxa vara, avascular necrosis, coxa valga or acetabular dysplasia, all this needs to be seen. Or problem with the growth and um, greater trochanter, which is becoming big. There can be many, many things to be followed up in these cases, you know, so... All of us need to insist on a very regular follow-up for these cases. Thank you, sir. Taran? Yeah. So, a similar, you know, uh, questions would be, uh, so which are the cases with DDH where you would say that I don't want to do anything and just leave them alone? No reconstruction or a, no open reduction, but some alternative procedures. What are your indications? Yeah, so, cases which present very late, which are very stiff, you know, they don't have that suppleness. 
where the femoral head is not in a good shape, small, uh, you can do an MRI degenerate scan and see the cartilage on top if the cartilage is not good. The acetabulum is bicompartmentalized. You know, there are two compartments in the acetabulum or the floor is very, very thick, you know, where you may have to reconstruct in some way which will not really be satisfactory. So I, I think generally the upper age limit uh, for me would be 14 or 15 years of age. You know. I have gone up to the age of 19, but the results have not been as good, you know, as you get them at an early age. You know. So I would not really advise, you can go for alternative procedure like a pelvic support osteotomy or carry on and have a joint replacement for me. Yeah. Uh, so one more question from my side. Have you had instances where after an open reduction, you have found that it reduces very well, but there's neither an anterior wall nor posterior wall. And it's actually the neck length, which is a little too short. If you just, if you, you wonder if you had a longer neck length, it would have stuck more uh, securely and they tend to keep on moving front back both ways it's very easy to reduce and if you do a derotation it might go back out posteriorly if you do, do too much it comes out anteriorly okay. so you just pin it and hope that it becomes stiff over a period of time do you have any experience so, so and how do you tackle those yeah. these are usually cases which have had surgery before you know? and there has been some avascular necrosis <clears throat> contributing to a short neck length you know and the joint just doesn't become stable, you know, unless you increase the length of the neck, you know. So you need to do a neck lengthening in these cases along with the advancing the trochanter, you know. And then for the acetabulum, some form of uh, augmentation will be required. So because you, you really, if you turn it, both the walls are not there and you turn yeah. it, it's no use, it will go back posteriorly. You know? So you need to augment in the best possible way all around you. Yeah. Thank you, sir. So I think that was a wonderful uh, algorithm and sir has really brought out the nuances of both sides of the hip joint. And I think it would be well that we remember what uh, Sandeep Hemadi also said about lateral acetabular avascular necrosis. I think we, we don't uh, talk about it as much. And maybe uh, I have this feeling that sometimes too early an acetabular surgery primarily just for indices correction may not be required and we may actually cause damage to the lateral edge trying to do an early Pemberton or early kind of a, labor, a supralabral surgery. It's just a thought. But and I'll it, move on to... Th yes, sir. Okay. This can also happen during an open reduction. You can yes, damage the yes, lateral yes, um, growth yes. plate of the acetabulum. Yes. So, so like it, sir, say, finally uh, said, it's a very serious surgery to be taken very, very seriously. Right. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, Taral, I, I would appreciate if you show your cases before we... So we are short of time, but I'm going to show one case, Sandeep, uh, which has also joy featured in it. Not just joy of treating it, but, uh, you know, joy had various roles to play, uh, you know, in management of this case. This boy actually, uh, you know, uh, presented to us with shortening of one lower limb, but has a long follow-up and, uh, you know, long consequences. Dr. Ashok Jori said that, uh, you know, you have to have a long follow-up and, uh, it's, it's a long story, uh, uh, open reduction of hip, he said that ne needs to have long follow because of consequences. So this is a similar child who had, uh, uh, you know, long story and consequences because there were lessons learned at every stage. So of course there were difficulties and there were mistakes, but mistakes when you learn from it becomes experiences. So, you know, let's go on to the case. In 2004, uh, this was just before the graph course, Sandeep. Uh, this boy, uh, this girl presented to us, uh, uh, you know, with right lower limb shortening, first born female child, no significant family history. And as usual, she was, treat, you know, told by the treating doctors and pediatrician that everything will be okay. And these, this was the x-ray uh, which was taken back over there, uh, you know, which uh, was reported as normal by the radiologist. Uh, was seen by a general orthopedic surgeon and said that you know, nothing seems to be abnormal. So since uh, Sally is there, if you can unmute yourself, Sally, and uh, as a radiologist, if this patient uh, presents to you, four-month-old child, a girl child, clinical examination is normal. There is no uh, hip click, ortolani, barlo, telescoping, all are fine. Uh, you know, what would you advise for this child? <laughs> 
I'm afraid I would disagree with the previous reports in that I think that there is a dysplastic right acetabulum uh, with decentering of the right hip. Yes, absolutely. So Shelton's line, uh, you know, is, yes, is not restored. Astabulum yeah. is, uh, uh, there is a break, astabulum is dysplastic. There is lateralization. And if you were to draw a, a, a vertical line, uh, you know, through the uh, lateral part of the pelvis and draw uh, center of the metaphysis, you know, this would tell you now, according to IHDI classification, that this is not a normal hip. Uh, so, so uh, you know, this was just after this, we had a graph course and, uh, you know, we, we ventured to do an ultrasound uh, on this patient. And uh, this was, you know, images of that time where this fell into type 2B, around 2B going into 3. And we said that this is a sort of an unstable hip and we must treat this. And the, the choice of treatment that time was to do a polyk harness, no polyk harness available in Bombay in 2004. So we went to a friendly orthotic shop and showed him pictures from the from, from the book and said, we want to make something like that. And he did make a polyk harness, which we, with some trial and error, we got it right and gave it to the patient. But the problem is, you know, the, the patient got lost to follow. They took the polyk harness. They came from 500 kilometers from Bombay. And we never saw them. They dropped the harness, dropped the doctor, and no follow. Alaric, uh, coming back to you, uh, you know, this is a patient. We had an x-ray. We got an ultrasound to diagnose. But we failed to treat this patient well. You know, according to you, what are the barriers to treatment uh, of a child with DDH? And, and co considering as a, our country as a whole, you know, Kashmir to Kanyakumari and from uh, Kutch to, uh, you know, Assam, you know, how do we organize to treat the patients in a, in a proper manner once we diagnose them? Thanks, Aral. I think uh, one of the first things is that awareness that people should have about the <coughs> spectrum that DDH has. Many of us think of DDH, even orthopedic surgeons, only as a frank dislocation. And there are so many varieties of hip dysplasia, which if not picked up in time, can lead to very severe biomechanical and other issues as the child grows older. So I think that creating an awareness among uh, not only pediatricians and uh, neonatologists, but also orthopedic surgeons, the fact that there are these varying grades of dysplasia that should be picked up. And now, thanks to the IHDI classification, even if you do not have uh, ultrasound available easily in your institution, I think uh, interpreting that, that x-ray carefully using the IHDI classification helps you identify very early that this child has a dysplastic hip which needs treatment. Of course, the other barriers there after you have diagnosed a hip dislocation is how to ensure that you retain the patient for follow-up and convince them about the need for treatment. I think that's also important. Uh, getting the pediatricians involved right in the beginning to tell them that a dysplastic hip should not be taken lightly. Uh, this needs early management with the public harness and convincing them of the importance of this early treatment is also essential uh, across the country. Thank you. What are the options in, in, in case if there is an area where, you know, polyk harness is just not available or they cannot get it in time or they cannot man get it manufactured to what it requires to do or, you know, it's very difficult to follow up a polyk harness treatment. What do you do? Alric, what are your solutions in that case? Well, of course, there are other devices that we can think in terms of. A public harness is basically a flexion abduction device that allows the hips to slide in, uh, A, traumatically, uh, you know, when the child is still young and the hips are still supple. But um, I can still understand that if it's uh, a difficulty in accessing a, a public harness, you can always wait for some time and then decide to put the child into a hip spica. So that's always an alternative. A very young baby, less than three months, may not tolerate a hip spica so well. But uh, as long as we treat the child in the first six months, and if we say we really don't have a public harness available, we are hesitant to refer the patient elsewhere where a harness is easily available, which should not really be a barrier nowadays. There's always the option of going in for a close reduction and a hip spiker treatment once the child is a little older, as long as we pick up and treat the dislocation before the age of six months. Okay. Thanks, Alric, for that. So going ahead, this child had a limp. Uh, when he started walking and uh, the parents were worried and they came back to us when the child was one year and two months old and this was the x-ray done that time uh, it shows now you know there is clear 
break in the sentence line, uh, dislocation. And uh, Sandeep, what is your choice of treatment? At 1.2 years, a child who presents like this, uh, how would you treat? Sandeep, can you? Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I was just unmuting myself. Uh, I think now he's in the walking age and secondary contractures would have developed. And I can see from the x-ray, like sir has pointed out, probably he's got excessive antiversion. The ossific nucleus has still not appeared. So uh, that is not a very good thing that could tell us that there may be some avascular necrosis. Um, my choice would be to do a formal open reduction, clear out all the intra-articular and extra-articular obstacles, seat the head deep into the acetabulum, do a femoral T-rotation with a little shortening if required, if it's too tight and uh, hold on to it at 1.2 years for the establishment to remodel, no establishment procedure as of now. So Sandeep, this patient, uh, you know, that time Joy Hospital has just started and Joy was mentors to all of us. So we, I showed this case to him and he said, apply the karu ya. We'll, we posted this patient for a close SOS open reduction at Joy Hospital. And he had acquired this new CM that time, which could record, uh, you know, the moving images. So this was at Joy Hospital and, uh, you know, we, we could easily get a reduction, you know, it just slipped inside and then, uh, you know, under his guidance uh, with him standing over my shoulder, we put an arthrogram die and these are, you know, videos way back from 2005, which showed that uh, it was a reduction with mood medial pulling of die was, uh, you know, less than 2 mm and the Ramses zone was safe uh, on table. And, uh, you know, you can recognize this uh, arm board, which was developed by him that time, which was there at Joy Hospital, which he used to use for giving hip spica. So, you know, with him being around and uh, his anesthetist being there, uh, you know, I was a very young pediatric orthopedic surgeon that time. So we said, we'll put this patient in spica. These were the quality of x-ray in spica that time. So you see that upon MRI career, and then we did MR and which confirmed that it was a concentric reduction. The quality of MR that time was not that great, uh, which could really show us, uh, you know, what is happening to the vascularity of the head as uh, the, some of the MRs do show now. But it did show us that this reduction was adequate. It was concentric. It was congruent. Uh, it was covered well. And uh, then we uh, sort of followed up this patient. So this is uh, a little longer follow up this patient. And, uh, uh, you know, the femoral head is developing, but there is a deficiency on the medial side. Dr. Jauhri, uh, you know, this is a follow-up where hip is stable, patient is doing fine, there is good range of movement. But if you see an x-ray like this or follow-up, uh, you know, how would you talk to the patients? What are your internal feelings within yourself as to how the child is doing? And were we right in doing, taking the decision of doing a close reduction at 1.2 years at that stage? So your comments. Well, Tarun, if you're... Uh... I would have done a close reduction, you know. So, and if your close reduction was atraumatic, you know, gentle close reduction, got the thing very deep. The MRI showed that it was very well contained, you know. So, I wouldn't blame the close reduction at all, you know. I, I, it's difficult to say why this has happened, you know. Whether there was pressure, some pressure there, or for what reason there is a medial sort of rarefaction which is present, you know. But right now, I would just wait and observe this child as to what happens. You know. So if there's a medial growth arrest, I would expect this to go into varus. You know. There is some degree of acetabular dysplasia. The acetabulum is large and shallow. You know, but again, I would just hold on for now. You know. I wouldn't do anything. So looking so at the there... medial gap here, Taral, looking yeah. at the medial gap here, do you think that the head is... Uh... Uh, perfectly centered or there is a double acetabulum which is developing what is happening the center there? line was intact but clinically this child did not so have you think this is all cartilage which is unossified possibly you know these are the hips where you're not sure about at that stage in life what was happening and okay. we said you know since there were uh, telescoping was negative the child did not have a limb and these were the x-rays and Shenton's line was intact as so I said, I also decided to play it safe. You know, told parents that maybe there is some, you know, uh, the head was out in that blood supply can get disturbed. We have put it in and then we'll wait and watch as to what is happening. Well, just one observation. There's a growth yes, arrest sir. line there on the neck, you know. So you see yes, that, sir, yeah. which yes. is present. You know. 
So, so that is huh? going right through, you know. So maybe the problem right. is good. You know? Yes, yes, yes. So that is going through and through. So it means that the, the, there is no obvious, you know, too severe a problem. But uh, this is something, uh, you know, uh, to be watched for. This is just coming, you know, looking at the patient over a period of time. This is at age of 2.2 years. And uh, the posterior, on the lateral view, you do see some fragmentation, but attempt at ossification. And then this is at almost three years age. You see the head is little larger uh, in medial, in a medial lateral format, sort of a coxa magna. There is some fragmentation, attempt at ossification. And then the patient came back directly at eight years. Uh, by that time, she was an athlete. She was in uh, Madhya Pradesh, uh, 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 100 feet uh, running championship. So doing very well as an athlete. But if you see an X-ray, uh, this is the X-ray, no pain, functionally doing excellently well. And uh, this is the condition at age eight years. So again, uh, you know, I will come back, come, go to Alaric first. And then Sandeep and sir, uh, you know, uh, you can just tell me in, in a line, in short, you know, what would be your management be at eight year asymptomatic, highly functional athlete with this kind of hip picture? What would you leave, do? Leave it. Thanks, Taral. You know, looking at this x-ray, this is not a normal hip. And we know that this hip will not last a lifetime. I can see changes of uh, what we call a type 2 avascular necrosis, where you have a valgus uh, neck. And uh, this will cause problems uh, for the child because of overloading. This is the time when we should be intervening. So we don't have to wait for symptoms when we know that the prognosis is not going to be good in the long term. I can see some luxation. I can see that there's a valgus neck. I can see uncovering of the head by almost 30%. This is a child who needs intervention irrespective of the symptoms. And it's better done earlier rather than later. So, to my mind, what, this, would be your, uh, yeah, what would be your formula yeah, or recipe? This was picked up a little earlier, say maybe around the age of five or six. We have now started to do a medial screw epiphysiodesis in the hope that with continued growth of the lateral side, uh, the valgus would correct. Maybe at eight years, that might not be so successful. So, this is probably an indication where you want to do a, a proximal femoral osteotomy. And depending upon the coverage that is then obtained, uh, whether some sort of an elastabular procedure is also required. Remember that when it comes to DDH, we want to normalize the hips as early as possible. And this is not a good looking hip, especially considering the fact that she's a young athlete. She needs a hip which is going to, which should last a lifetime. And this hip certainly won't. Thanks. Sandeep, anything, any, anything different from no? You again, I, some additional I, like, points? I was, I was not very convinced about the Shenton's line. Initial X-rays also, I don't think the Shenton's line was in continuity. It was slipping right. up. The, so you would have treated at that stable. stage. Would you have treated I, at that I, stage? Yes, I would have done. My primary thing is that I think uh, it's better to do at walking age a uh, open procedure with a derotation osteotomy. Uh, right. To keep the hip uh, more inferomedial rather than allowing it to slip up. Anyhow, what now, do do now? the what situation do do? is that I think there is not only a coxa valga, there is caput valgum also. And okay. uh, that uh, with subluxation is not very healthy. The combination is instability as well as a deformity. So okay. probably what, you are going to do? Yeah, you are going to need advanced imaging and a periestabular osteotomy. Uh, like a GANS or a modified at, at eight At 8 years. Yes, age, and, a virus, uh, and, and a oh, virus and a virus rotation. You will have to correct on both sides is what I feel. You will do an estabular procedure plus a few. Uh, Dr. Jory, what would be your uh, take on this? Comments and solutions? Yeah, so, so I'm not too sure. Uh, I mean, there was avascular necrosis in your initial x-ray, you know, so I'm not too sure why that has happened in I mean, I, I believe the reduction was atraumatic. It's difficult to explain why that has happened. However, the head is reconstituted very well. There is a valgus deformity which is present. Here. So we'll have to take care of the valgus, as Alaric has emphasized. Here. We need to do a virus osteotomy and see the coverage. I think uh, the uncoverage is not very great. So it may be well contained just by this. You know, If not, we do need to do a lateral acetabuloplasty or a triple osteotomy. You know, that should solve the problem. I agree, sir. So there was a medial side AVN, which which ideally the medial side should have grown less. But here you see more medial side overgrowing and causing a valgus. So, you know, probably AVN in DDH 
you know, there are no fixed rule books and 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 one has to see follow up and see how things work out really we really don't know what happened how and uh, you know what are, what is actually happening there but now we know this is this is a result the parents did not agree for surgery here so there are multiple occasions where you know uh, things uh, the decisions were taken in in a different manner things happened in a different manner and and this is actually what tells us the socio cultural background of treating dh in a country it's not by the books it's not by the yeah. algorithm and whatever number of algorithms you make you know you will have to provide place for these outliers where situational orthopedics uh, situational orthopedics absolutely so you know this girl continued to do athletics and then finally came in 2016 with a hip pain and she was hurting she couldn't run uh, very well any longer and that time uh, you know uh, to cut the long story short we we did take help from dr prasad gurneni who had done a workshop uh, at sandeep again this was done in memory of joy patankar so you know joy had various roles to play uh, this was the pune workshop where masters series with moa which sandeep had organized uh, you know in 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 joy's memory that time and then uh, you know we got a ct scan done and studied this and uh, he uh helped us with a, a periastabular ostomy now the acetabulum was closed triridated cartilage was closed so it was possible to do a good periastabular ostomy femoral ostomy and that's how the hip looked at end of the surgery uh, uh we also you know he, we tried to minimize the shortening in this patient and try to uh, get the trochanter uh, to a level where there will be no abductor lurch because she was an athlete so this was an early follow up she went back into training range of movement exercises strengthening this is 3 months down the line after healing of all osteotomies and uh, happy to say this is a longer follow up for her where uh, the implants have been removed uh, the, the the screws uh, in the neck uh, sort of uh, these screws had cut through the head, head and we couldn't just <laughs> remove it but we just kept them uh you know as a remembrance of the surgery but excellent uh, range of movement she is a yoga instructor she is a national level player right now and uh, uh, she can also jump with joy uh, as a tribute mm. to the person who also guided uh, sort of her her uh, treatment plan uh, as she was growing up and finally got her to an activity level which she desires to be so you know uh, thanks for everyone uh, for being today here contributing to this session and to this problem and uh, uh, thanks to joy uh, for being a mentor for many of younger uh, orthopedic students to take up pediatric orthopedics and uh, you know give, giving them a, a vision and ambition to do in, do well in life sandeep i think uh, it's it's close to 1 o'clock and yeah. i think with this case uh, we should wind up uh i think i you. think that was absolutely a wonderful case which showed us the spectrum of uh, the uh, problems that uh, a ddh patient can have right from a very small and it reemphasized what dr jori sir said a long follow up and a close follow up i think hats off to you for making the patient come to you for maybe 15 16 years and not losing that patient <laughs> so that <laughs> because you know how our patients are fickle minded they'll just hop from one place to another run away and then you really don't know what's happening so that has really they did, huh? did disappear at crucial times but only to come back <laughs> okay so that sums up the story of ddh uh, in india and again let me thank everybody who's been here today to celebrate joy's 60th birthday and um, dipti we are very grateful that a lot of uh, newer initiatives that joy started at that time uh, are looking at uh, coming to fruition with uh, the new indian guidelines being developed by alaric and posi under his leadership dr jori taking a very strong leadership position in making sure that that happens and guiding us constantly we thank dr jori for his time in spite of his Uh, multiple busy schedules and commitments he always finds time for joy that speaks volumes about his love for joy thank you very much sir for that thank you sandeep thank you uh, sandeep dipti taral everyone uh, really i mean i i have been telling dipti i'm always there it is just that i was traveling and uh, you know i i didn't have much time to you yeah. know so I, i wanted a topic which was a familiar topic you know that's yes. all
was my request. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very yeah. much for your time and for your unconditional support, sir, as always. Really and let me let, let me thank the IOA for IOA. Yes. making me uh, or allowing me to do this in joyous memory. It's an IOA initiative program which we have combined it. I thought it would be a good opportunity to uh, pay tribute to Joy as well as popularize the guidelines on the IOA platform across the country so that a lot more many people can access and start using the guidelines. Thank you, Sally, for being there as Joy's friend as well as a mentor for hip sonography. And the icing on the cake was Professor Graf. Who really, it was nice of him to wake up so early and be here with us and uh, talk a few words about Joy. And Sandeep Hemadi, who is in actually skiing in Kurwalden in Switzerland. And he lost his laptop in the flight. And uh, he sent me a text at 2 a.m. in the morning. I don't have any slides. I'm not going to do the talk. I made him wake up at 4 a.m. and send me all his slides and we ran them from here. And uh, thanks, Sandeep, for uh, your love for Joy and making sure that this happens. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Dipti. Thank you, Ashok Thank Sham you. and Ortho TV. Thanks, Taral, for that wonderful case. And uh, I guess uh, we'll all wish Joy a very happy 60th birthday and sign off from you. Thank you very Thank much. You, Thank you, Sandeep and Taral, for organizing this whole webinar. And Thank taking you. the initiative to so. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Ashok. Wherever there is joy, there is always action. So I don't. I'm not surprised. But... <laughs> Thank you. Have a good afternoon and watch sir, the sir, India to Australia match. You can uh, switch off the recording, please. Yeah. Sir, sir was saying something. Sorry, sir. Okay. Sorry. No, no. I was just saying bye to everyone. Thanks a lot, sir. No, no, Thank no, you so no, much. Problem. Thank pleasure you, to be here. It was a real pleasure to be here, you know. And I think these are small steps, you know, at making our people aware, educating them, enlightening them. And Dipti has been doing human service. You know, it's a great cause. It's a good yes, cause. And we all are always there to support you. Thank you very much, sir. Really appreciate it. Thank all you, right. Taral. Thank Bye. you, Sandeep. Great Bye, job. Everyone. Have a great day. Bye-bye. Sally and Alaric. I think he's left, but... Thanks to him too. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye, bye everybody. Thank you. Mm -hmm.